I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We'll continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. My guest today is the Canadian University professor, Anthony Hall, a man who taught Native American studies but became attracted to the issue of occupied Palestine and the oppressed people of the region. He faced difficulties concocted by the Zionist lobby, yet he survived the case. Watch this interview to follow the story. Dr. Anthony James Hall is a Canadian scholar and university professor. He became a full professor of globalization studies at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. And since 1982, he's been teaching Native American studies, liberal education, and globalization studies. Professor Hall has been suspended and harshly pulled from his classroom because of expressing his own views on Israeli crimes and violations. In 2016, Dr. Hall's work on 9-11, false flag terrorism, and the parallels in the genocidal dispossession of Native Americans and Palestinians became the target of a historic witch hunt led by the Israeli lobby in Canada. Dr. Hall is the editor-in-chief of American Herald Tribune. He's the author of the award-winning books The American Empire and the Fourth World, as well as Earth into Property, Colonization, Decolonization, and Capitalism. The second volume of this book was selected by Independent UK as one of the best English history books published in 2010. His current schedule of research and publication is aimed at bringing to light deeper analysis of the very topics that his detractors have targeted as unsuitable for inclusion in university curricula. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm going to be doing a, quite a spontaneous uh, mm -hmm. uh, interview with you here in Beirut. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the middle of a trip, actually, and uh, we still have a few more days to go. Mm -hmm. uh, it was good to have you in, in Tehran back in, in the days that were. And then, of course, you went through so much trouble mm -hmm. with, uh, with the lobby in Canada. Mm -hmm. And then you survived it. Mm -hmm. and you survived it, and um, you're here to share some of your um, thoughts with the group that you have met, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So we're happy to have that. Let me go. Um, academically, you focused on the indigenous people of Canada. You mm -hmm. started there, mm -hmm. and you then you, you started broadening out mm -hmm. as the world was changing, and you reacted yes. to some, some of the oppression that in the academia, they're mostly quiet about it. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of stood out because not that many people dared mm -hmm. talk about these subjects. And the academia and the classroom, you're supposed to be very sub, uh, subdued and you talk the, what the line of the powerful are. But in Canada, you didn't do that. And we see now more saliently today what you did a decade mm -hmm. ago when you started. Mm -hmm. Talk about how after your research and your great books that came out, the big volumes I still have in my library, uh, you came to a point that you had, you began to stand up and talk. And mm -hmm. I know it, it pervaded into your classroom. Yeah. You believe the youth should hear these. It was as if a sacred knowledge was there and it had to be passed. And you were not, you were relentless towards the authorities. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there was a, a period where 
there was something of a divergence where in the classroom, you know, people, you don't want to proselytize and you don't want to put people in a corner where they seem to feel they're being uh, um, preached to or something. And so one speaks, one steps gently and, uh, you know, it's very conscientious. Try, I try to be conscientious about going through the stages, not jumping to the final conclusion right away and scaring the wits out of, you know, your registered students. But then there's another kind of discourse uh, which really developed with Kevin Barrett and doing our own show, you know, False Flag Weekly News, uh, where we talk about the weekly news, but from the perspective that uh, we're largely being uh, played and lied to by the mainstream media and by the high-ranking authorities. And of course, in that milieu, you're talking to an audience who kind of take a lot for granted and you can talk about things, you know, in a, in a different way. So that, that was striking to me that uh, really I, I don't think I'd gone into great detail about Zionism or Israel in my classroom. Uh, but, you know, when I was speaking to another audience outside the university, Right. And it seemed to me that this uh, speaking to the uh, general public or to a p particular constituency in, mm -hmm. in the general public, uh, you know, the, the idea is, well, bring out what you're thinking, what the fruits of your research are. And it seems to me that's public service. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the work with Kevin Barrett, who's, of course, a distinguished and erudite man, mm -hmm. been persecuted himself. I looked at that as a kind of public service, and it seemed to me to be the higher level of what would come out of a university, what you would expect of a university, mm -hmm. where uh, how, how are people who, say, have a catharsis on 9-11 mm -hmm. or some false flag event, um, okay, so you've seen through that, now what? Once the uh, uh, illusion begins to crumble, Right. And you have to cope with a, a, a reality that, uh, you know, is, is a difficult reality. Mm -hmm. uh, helping people as a community of sort of truth mm -hmm. seekers uh, on False Flag Weekly News or on internet discussions, uh, that, uh, you know, was a, was a trajectory in its own right. Mm -hmm. So I, I re it was surprising to me that uh, suddenly all of this... Um, uh, narrative about what was happening in my classroom was just made up, I felt, you know, no, I, n I, n I never once had a complaint from a Jewish student who said, you know, I, I was uncomfortable in Professor Hall's classroom, not once, you know, and I had, uh, you know, m many years of uh, proper student evaluations, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I didn't have complaints or people saying they're uncomfortable, but suddenly when the smear began, when Bene Brith, you know, planted this Facebook post and we've been through all of this, you know, um, published uh, as if I'd said these terrible things. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was interesting that Joshua Goldberg, who is now in, the story is he's now in uh, penitentiary in the United States mm -hmm. for terrorism-related matters, mm -hmm. that he was uh, pretending to be Australi witness, mm -hmm. encouraging fellow jihadists, you know, to go to... Uh, this event in 2015 in Texas and uh, raise a ruckus and maybe shoot some people. Uh, anyway, he wrote, wrote this uh, awful um, Facebook post which was put on my Facebook wall for a few hours and then taken off. And I never did see it. I didn't know it about it at the time. Anyway, that was, uh, in my case, that's how the smear began. It's not what I s said. It's what was Put on, uh, right. put on me. So, mm -hmm. uh, so then suddenly there was this whole onslaught of uh, a, f a fabricated narrative, uh, making the impression that the Professor Hall has people, you know, falling out of his classroom, uh, upset and disoriented because he's talking about such radical subjects, and and, and it, it was very offensive, and it was a, f a gross fabrication. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, Anyway, that's, that, that's what happened, and I was suspended without pay, without any of the 
proper procedures according to the collective agreements and such. Universities are supposed to be places of you know, policies and rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the faculty association took up my cause uh, and we did go to court and uh, the, uh, of course, you know, I wasn't dealing directly with Bene Breath Canada. I was dealing with uh, the Board of Governors of my university. Right. And it was shocking to me to see how quickly and easily they were more or less taken over mm -hmm. by this lobby. Mm -hmm. And simply then, uh, you really couldn't tell them apart after a certain stage, you know, what, what is the voice of the lobby and what is the voice of the Board of Governors of your own university. So the Board of Governors lost the case. The faculty association won the case. I was reinstated, mm -hmm. but you know the atmosphere had become so poisonous, really, mm -hmm. and, and and you know a, a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I was 67 years old, and I've retired, mm -hmm. and so there was never any convictions, or you know, there's nothing mm -hmm. written anywhere that uh, you did such and such, and it was proven and such and such. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm professor emeritus. And, uh, yes. and, uh, and uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, I start to look at, at more and more as a sort of asset, the kind of education, as you mentioned, the kind of, um, you know, facing uh, the reality, mm -hmm. the harsh realities of really how power is exercised mm -hmm. and how careers are being uh, tampered with and really destroyed, reputations are being destroyed. It's a very classic, uh, uh, you know, methodology. Uh, let me ask you this question. It just occurred to me. Criticizing Israel before 9-11 was not that sensitive. Mm -hmm. I remember people talked about it. I mean, um, and it was never like a, like a red line that mm -hmm. you'll be thrown off uh, mm -hmm. the cliff because yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. But after 9-11, it became a super sensitive thing uh, with, with, with some of the things that came out of 9-11, and mm -hmm. it was, you know, it uh, uh, it went into the news and people reading about it, the, the dancing Israelis, mm -hmm. this, that. I mean, the different aspects. So it, it turned into a red line. It's one of those mm -hmm. red lines it became. It, would you say that you distinguished 9/11 as an event that uh, separated uh, criticizing Israel before 9/11 was you could get by. It's not a big mm -hmm. deal. It's, it, was, it was not a red line. It was not you did not scare anybody off. But mm -hmm. after that. You were you were uh, you were targeted. Yes. Well, 9/11 is such a big part of almost everything. It so dramatically transforms the society we're living in in the Occident. Uh, uh, so 9/11, uh, uh, you know, you you start to see. Well, if the 19 uh, Saudis with box cutters, you know, run by Osama bin Laden in a cave in Afghanistan, if it if it wasn't that. And it doesn't take too long to realize that's an absurd story. Who was it? And then, you know, the roads lead very clearly to, I, I wouldn't say, uh, it's not as simple as saying Israel, it's, uh, I would say it leads to Israel first partisans. You know, mm -hmm. many people involved are American citizens and they work within the U.S. government and uh, ultimately they're operating within the sphere of responsibility of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. But they put Israel first, right. and uh, we call them neoconservatives. Uh, so, you know, as you start to develop an idea, well, 9-11 is a big event. Mm -hmm. It's a classic, perfect subject, I think, for analysis at a university. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think one of the, um, you know, kind of tragic uh, elements of the failure of the academy is that we never did develop a real base to uh, do this 9-11 studies uh, yeah. and have proper conferences yeah. and journals, people have tried. And it's, it's not surprising that we've run into difficulties. For instance, Noam, Noam Chomsky, you know, who, who many see as the pinnacle of you know, dissident articulation in the universities. I mean, he was very aggressive uh, in uh, doing ad hominem attacks on anybody who would study 9-11 as if it's somehow obscene, as if it somehow uh, goes against uh, kind of reasonable uh, discourse in the university. Uh, and, you know, you really have to wonder what, what, what is his motivation in uh, trying to demean uh, this line of study. And, uh, you know, this is, after all, crucial to 
the, our system of war and peace or life and death in the West. This is something we want to get to the bottom of. Uh, but with the likes of Noam Chomsky condemning this line of inquiry, it's, it's been a difficult line of inquiry. You know, as, I, as, as the years went by and I finally did get my promotion to uh, full professor, tenured many years ago, and uh, you know, the, the university countered it and I ended up uh, hiring a lawyer and eventually the administration came up, uh, came up with a red, white flag of sorts. Uh, you know, okay, you, we, we back off, you're, you're full professor. So, you know, not a big deal to, to go from associate to full professor. But in my case, you know, it was, a, it was something of an ordeal in its own right. And I suppose the forces were starting to organize to try to prevent me from uh, being in a position where I could articulate, I thought, with some protections. You know, a tenured full professor in a Canadian university you would think that would be just about as protected as a, as a person in the West could be. Mm -hmm. So I, I did make a, a commitment to myself and to my professional role to say, well, at this stage now, I'm going to just continue to do research that seems to me uh, meaningful and important, and I know it's controversial. And because I'm in this senior position, I'm going to do the controversial work. And mm -hmm. to heck with it. Nobody's in a position to say, uh, this is not allowed. You have to follow the textbook. Here's the curriculum. I'm making the curriculum. That's the, that's the deal. That's, I must say the, the whole uh, idea of, uh, you know, you, you jump through all the hoops. You get the tenure job. You write the books. You, mm -hmm. you, 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 know, you take the student evaluations. You go through all these things. And then suddenly the rules changed. And the rules changed with 9-11. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this uh, uh, thing that you're going through, being a global terrorist, mm -hmm. uh, being designated that way. I mean, this is part of a pattern that I'm seeing, which is, you know, the preventive warfare idea, preemptive warfare. Right. This is a new concept. I mean, this it's not a new concept, but to actually see this adopted as policy, which is eventually saying, we don't need to go by any rules. We don't need to go by the principle that people are innocent until proven guilty. We'll just declare them to be guilty and uh, sort of dress them up in a jailbird costume. And if they can prove themselves at some point to be innocent, okay. And, you know, try to prove yourself innocent walking around with a, a you know, well, you know, the, you, you look at it and you people would say, well, he was suspended. He, he must have done something wrong, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a university. Surely they have uh, protections and such. So to get through uh, the idea, no, this, this is a new, uh, a new frontier is being crossed here. And the new frontiers are being crossed in so many ways. And so many thousands of people, many of them Muslims, you know, found themselves in torture chambers and no due process whatsoever. All these... Uh, principles of, you know, Western uh, liberty mm -hmm. and the protections of citizenship and such. I mean, it, it fell by the wayside. So 9-11, you know, has consequences on the way society is structured. And, you know, the, so one of the things that Kevin Barrett and I would talk about, of course, is 9-11. Is so talking about 9-11 became kind of a part of the sort of um, alleged crimes. Uh, and it, it was striking to me, it was actually in the written um, uh, allegation that you talked about 9-11 and you didn't say Arabs did it. And you have to say Arabs did it because everybody knows Arabs did it. And uh, hey, wait a minute, you know, you, you didn't, the Board of Governors aren't an expert on this. Uh, you know, the, you have these administrators kind of saying, well, we can trump you now because you're talking nonsense, and we know all about 9/11, and we have a you know a higher uh, understanding of it. Uh, and to me, this is wow. This is a violation. I mean, you develop expertise in areas in a university, and if the administration just walks in and says, "Well, any any expertise that you might have developed, we're we're calling you out on this. We we have a higher source of information, or, or whatever it is." So this preemptive concept. I felt that I was, uh, they, they, they referred to my suspension as a precautionary measure. Mm -hmm. 
well, precaution against what? You know, it's almost like it was uh, the concept of a terrorist professor is being uh, sort of invented. And you're, you know, as a global terrorist, you're kind of being invented. Like, well, don't ask us what it is, you know, we'll, we'll tell you later. But for the time being, you have this title and you can't get on a plane and, you know, you will be punished. And uh, we can't prove anything, but we'll eventually get around to proving something. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's really turned the world... And if 9-11 is not exposed, and if we don't get to the bottom of what really happened, you know, we're, we're in a kind of enslaved condition. Uh, there's just no getting away from the fact that this creates, this takes the creation of illusion to a new level. And uh, how do you, you know, what do you do in the classroom when you break the news to students that, you know, what you see on the 6 o'clock news, the world that you see explained for, for you there, is, is really not the real world and it's, and it's amazing to look at what went into putting together that six o'clock news broadcast, you know, all the different uh, uh, PR uh, studies and all the different uh, spin doctoring that happens. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, you speak and time just flies. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. um, I'm going to continue this conversation at another location as the days go by. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions about our trip down to the south, but I'll leave that for later. Uh, for the time being, thank you so much, Anthony, and it's, it's a pleasure to have you on board on the New Horizon Conference in Beirut. Thank you very much, Nader. Yeah. Hope you've enjoyed the interview with Professor Anthony Hall. Stay tuned. Thank you.